The collaboration started with the part, a project from 2004 to 2006, acting in an emerging public sphere constructed through digital code. The more recent body of work is known as Headless, started in 2007 and is ongoing. The solo exhibitions include the decapitation of money at the Cadiz Foundation, Headless from the public record at Index, and Golden and Senebi, Headless at the power plant. Angus Cameron is an academic social scientist with a diverse disciplinary background in art history, international political economy, journalism, and geography. Currently working in the geography department at the University of Leicester, his main current research interests include spatial and cartographic theory, libidinal political economy, the emergence and transformation of fiscal spatialities, and the strange materialities of economies. Since 2008, he has acted as the spokesperson for Golden and Senebi's ongoing performance art project, Headless, and is increasingly working with other contemporary artists. He is currently writing two books, Xenospace, an essay on the outside, and Body and State. And as discussed with the artists and him, the idea is that this is a conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. This conversation is to be about Golden and Senebi mm. and their working process in the Project Headless. Yeah. Quite honestly, I had expected to meet them in person, so I have to begin by asking, who are you and why are you here? <laughs> uh, I'm their representative, their agent. Uh, occasionally, when I'm being pedantic, I call myself uh, their emissary. Uh, I'm sent in their place. Uh, and the reason I'm here rather than them in person uh, is partly because they do this with a number of their projects, but it's particularly important with Headless. What Headless does is to mimic uh, the practices of offshore finance. Uh, specifically, uh, we are all, this is a, a map of the project in, as it was in 2008, it would be considerably bigger than this now, um, uh, and the whole pro thing is called Looking for Headless. And it, Headless Limited, which is at the core of this thing, is an offshore company registered in the Bahamas, which is about all we know about it. Uh, we know it's real because we've seen the registration papers, but beyond that, not much. Um, and as the project unfolds, various people, including myself, novelists, uh, designers, curators, uh, a whole gamut of people, you can see some of them up there, deliver parts of this project on behalf of Golden and Senebi. So they use, as Offshore does, agents and representatives to maintain secrecy, uh, hide identity, hide ownership, hide authorship, and so on. And so that's why I'm here. And why do you believe Golden and Senebi have chosen you to speak on your behalf, Idas, there? Uh, I'm not entirely sure because I've never asked them. Um, I, I first came, became involved with the project at a meeting. Uh, you'll see it up there. It says Tower 42, Tower 42 in the City of London. Uh, a group of people came together at their request and sat in a, uh, an office in Tower 42 and t talked about offshore uh, for two hours. They were not there. Um, quite why I was asked subsequently to be their spokesperson, I don't know. I suspect it's because I wouldn't shut up. Um, but I, I don't know. And let's talk more about the Headless Project. It's a mm -hmm. project which uh, is ongoing. It's actually started in 2007. Yep. And uh, Golden and Senevi call it a research project. I wondered what exactly is the focus of this, of this research? Um, the ostensible focus is Headless Limited, the offshore company. Um, but there is much more to it than that. Uh, there is a sort of art historical, philosophical backstory uh, that draws in uh, Georges Bataille's secret society from the 1930s called Acephal, which means headless. And part of the premise of the project is to posit a potential link between Acephal, which was this rather odd and frankly ineffective secret society in the late 1930s, uh, and Headless Limited, as though somehow Headless Limited could have inherited uh, Bataille's organization. And so what we explore, or what we research in the course of the various events and performances and contributions is Bataille, uh, the themes Bataille developed in some of his work about sovereignty, about bodies, about uh, presence and absence and so on, related to contemporary economies, uh, offshore finance, banking, uh, sovereignty again, uh, and so on. So the research project is open, it's not sort of, it has focal points, but it doesn't sort of uh, have an end point in it. Uh, as it were, uh, it, it has grown, and it, it grows with the various people that become involved as representatives and agents, because we all bring our own uh, interests, knowledges, 
obsessions to the project. Now you say we, mm. so I suppose you are involved. How exactly are you involved in this, in this research? I'm involved in the research in the sense that it overlaps with my own work, my, my kind of independent work. Um, and perhaps that is again a reason why I was asked to uh, uh, be involved. I mean, my particular obsessions at the moment are boundaries and spatialities and these things I call xenospaces, these spaces of pure exteriority, uh, of which offshore is a peculiar and particular example. So we are involved to the extent that we bring these ideas to headless and contribute to the overall uh, knowledge structure, the overall um, storyline and uh, emerging narrative uh, uh, of the project. Maybe it would be interesting to hear a little bit more about this idea of economic imagination mm. and the sort of bearing it has upon this project. Um, this is, I mean, it was in Headless before I participated. Headless was running for a year before I uh, got involved. Uh, my particular interest in economic imagination stems from a book I wrote in 2004 called The Imagined Economies of Globalization, where we explore the fact that this term we all use, globalization, is imaginary. And there's nothing new about that. All economies are imaginary. If we imagine the national economy with a, a nice crisp line drawn around it, uh, that's clearly nonsense. But we still subscribe to these notions of economic sovereignty and economic nationality uh, uh, and, and economic patriotism as though they had some kind of natural, logical uh, purchase, which they don't. Um, and so economic imagination is something that's dynamic and volatile uh, and one of the things that Headless is doing uh, through all its various participants uh, is to explore how we can imagine economic space. One way of thinking about Headless is that is in itself an imagined economic space. This has been constructed out of nothing. There is nothing there. Most of this is fictional. Uh, uh, most of us are fictionalized and semi-fictionalized. Uh, for those of you who don't know, there's a, as the project has unfolded, it's been written up as a novel, uh, a rather uh, trashy uh, crime thriller called Looking for Headless, in which we all appear as characters and we all do various things. Um, that probably answers the question. Who wrote this book? Ah, uh, ostensibly it's written by uh, someone called, I don't know if you can read it up there, uh, uh, the fictional author KD, deliberate pun intended. Uh, KD is, uh, uh, refers to a real person. Uh, they can only use the initials of this person's name now because of a certain uh, uh, troubling legal action that took part, uh, place at the beginning of it. Uh, not everyone involved in this is willing, by the way, or knowing. A lot of these people do not know they're part of Headless. Um, but, Behind KD is a British author living in Spain by the name of John Barlow uh, who writes the novel um, or writes most of it. Uh, chapter 12, which has just been written, uh, was written in my voice uh, uh, as the final chapter of the novel. I say in my voice, it was not written by me. Um, and so John Barlow wrote that uh, uh, in Spain. We've never met either. But it's not the first time that you speak on behalf of the artists you spoke mm. actually at the power plant in Toronto in 2008. In the talk you gave there, you compared their search for Headless with the travels of Sir John Mandeville. Mm. Could you explain this parallel? Um, for those who don't know John Mandeville, uh, he was a, a knight of St. Albans who wrote a book first published in 1396. Uh, which uh, uh, tracked his travels uh, through a medieval Mappa uh, Mundi of the kind we've just seen, um, from Britain through Europe to Jerusalem, and then beyond that to the land of Prester John, and beyond that to the uh, edges of paradise. Uh, what I was particularly interested in was, were two aspects of it. One was Mandeville himself. Sir John Mandeville, who was regarded by European scholars for many hundreds of years as a kind of geographer or a proto-geographer uh, for this extraordinary travelogue he writes in the Middle Ages uh, never existed. And in fact, the stories are compiled from 27 different sources at least. Um, and he's this multiple author. It also appears as a multiple text. Uh, there are many, many different versions of the travels of St. John, St. John Mandeville. But long before Gutenberg, long before the printing press, this thing was in multiple languages, multiple volumes, multiple versions. The other aspect of it that particularly interested me was the, not paradise, which he doesn't reach, but the land of Prester John. 
because uh, Prester John was an imaginary priest king who was believed to inhabit a, 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 an extraordinarily wealthy, powerful kingdom in the east. Nowhere particularly, but just in the east. And the legend of Prester John was used to legitimize a number of things, but particularly the Crusades. And the idea was that uh, uh, Western uh, Crusaders would be met by Prester John uh, coming in the other direction to crush the infidel uh, in the Middle East. Uh, not much has changed, as you can see. You've talked about offshore finance in mm. some previous talks I read as immoral, excessive, and also exclusionary. Mm. And in your book, The Imagined Economies, of globalization, mm -hmm. you point out how offshore is pictured as something external, yep. something on the outside. I was wondering if there are any kind of parallels between the art world, because I thought you referred to that mm -hmm. in a previous text. Um, the, the, the theme of the art world actually is less coming from me than from Golden said of it themselves. One of the uh, 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 core aspect, if you look up there, it says a sovereign art prize. Uh, sovereign art prize is run by a company called the Sovereign Group, or the Sovereign Trust, I think it is, uh, which is an offshore company, which purely coincidentally are the company that registered Headless Limited. And Golden and Senebi have actually submitted parts of Headless to the Sovereign Art Prize. Uh, I didn't win it, but I had a, I had a go. Um, with respect to the position of the art world as being outside, I'm not sure. I think the art world sometimes likes to think of itself as being on the outside and very edgy, um, or perhaps beyond the edge. Uh, but I think one of the points of Headless is that the art world both inhabits these external spaces and is affected by these external spaces, but is also grounded and material and economic in itself. So I don't, I mean, we have this image of the art world as uh, external and artists as being creatures of externality, which in many ways is what enables them to do what they do, but there are distinctly obdurate links back to the material world. Got two last questions. Your presence here today mm -hmm. reveals this complex relationship between fiction and reality. Do you represent reality here as well as in the novel? Um, reality define, um, I suppose. I mean, what's real? What's real? <laughs> Uh, in headless uh, is is everything and nothing. Um, it is a it is a, a, a pure fiction, a pure fantasy. It's a terribly sort of elaborate uh, uh, project, but it's also real um, because I'm sitting here talking to you about it, and you're all sitting here listening to me talk about it. So it has a distinct reality, um, and likewise with fiction. Uh, the, the fictional aspects of the project are at its core, uh, not only the fact that most of the people involved are fictional and it's being written up as a fiction, but it's, it's about a fiction and it's this fiction of offshore, this notion of something that's offshore. Behind this comfortable topological language is an entirely fictional uh, uh, legal concoction. It's not real, it's not offshore. Uh, the world's biggest offshore centre is the City of London, uh, which last time I looked was still very much uh, uh, rooted to uh, the rest of Britain. Um, but beyond that, I mean, any economy is fictional and has been for hundreds of years. For about 300 years after the 1450s, uh, any book of accounts for any bank, particularly Ital Italian banks, would have a category for imaginary money. And it was called imaginary money. And it wasn't, didn't cause anybody any problems, it was just money that happened to be imaginary. It was never, nonetheless real for that. The only reason we don't call money imaginary now is not because it's all somehow magically become real, but because it's all imaginary. Every aspect of the economy is imaginary. Um, so reality fiction, we all live the fiction. My last question. This is a research with many layers and complexities. It's also a very long-term project over many years. Mm -hmm. But what do you feel Golden and Senebi are trying to say with their performative invisibility, which they become more and more invisible? Hmm, I wonder if they have. I don't know if they've become more invisible. I wrote a piece for them last December. Uh, on the one occasion, I couldn't go and be them. Uh, and we inverted things. And they were them, but I wrote the script. And the piece was called Anywhere You Aren't, uh, an exploration of Golden and Senebi's repeated and failed attempts to become virtual. One aspect of their work has been this attempt to virtualize the artist completely, to become, if not invisible, then visible only in certain uh, particular ways. Uh, and as we, well mainly me, explored in that lecture, they haven't been able to become virtual. And I'm not entirely sure why that's the case. We, we, we use this word virtual, we believe this word virtual has a meaning. But when you actually try and become virtual, 
through online worlds as they've done with the port and, and, and other things through Second Life uh, or through their present absence from this room, um, they become highly visible. And one of the, the, the most visible uh, aspect of Headless, whenever I've a, a appeared, has of course been the people who aren't there. So have they become virtual? I don't know. They seem very actual to me. Thank you so much, Angus Cameron. Thank you so much, Colleen Senevi. Thank you. Thank you.